Today's special guest is Jonathan McHugh. Jonathan is coming to us from LA. He comes from the world of uh, publishing and music supervision and composing and uh, what else you do, Jonathan? <laughs> Film producing, TV producing. Film producing, TV producing. So anyway, we'll let Jonathan uh, tell you his story and, and talk to you about what he's got on his mind. Please welcome Jonathan McHugh. So John, how do I pull that up if I want that set? How y'all doing today? So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my path to start out because I think it's always applicable uh, to figure out where people come from and how you guys are actually in school and you know how are you actually going to get a job and make a career out of this business, um, which in today's day and age is, is a challenge. Uh, I found this. I pulled this off the wall by the elevator. Has anybody seen this? It's, anybody know about it? Anybody go to it? Okay. Anyway, it's just interesting. I mean, it's a you know, it's obviously a show someone put together uh, yesterday um, at the Dragon's Den, and the title of it is "Funeral for the Music Industry." So I thought that was pretty applicable because as, as obviously you know, we see all the dire conversation about the music business being taken such a hit even before the economy started to take a hit, and now it all dovetails together and 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 hurts the situation. Um, I worked in the record business for, I want to say, 15 years, probably more than that. Yeah, so 15 to 20 years, um, and I left about two years ago. But I'll start. I'll start with the path, so you kind of get a clear understanding. I was uh, I grew up in New York City, and I came to Tulane at 17. Um, you know, into your basic rock and roll. Never really experienced the amazing music that New Orleans has to offer. And while I was here. Uh, during my freshman year, I got, I met some guys in New Jersey at a party, and next thing you know, who worked at TUL, and I started volunteering at TUL, kind of ripping the news and just basic doing grunt work, whatever it took, because I was fascinated by it. I'd, I'd love to listen to it, uh, and I was like, you know, this is pretty amazing. So the guy that I met was the promotion director of the radio station, and he controlled all the tickets to all the shows in town, because obviously back then there was no good commercial radio in town. There was a bad rock station. And that was pretty much it. There was no alternative station. There was, there was, OZ wasn't, wasn't what it was today. So TUL had a lot of juice and um, covered the whole city. So we ended up getting a lot of shows that nobody else would promote. One of the shows was The Grateful Dead. And The Grateful Dead came here, I want to say 1981 or 80, for the first time since, everybody remember the song Truckin'? With the lyrics busted down on Bourbon Street, set up like a bowling pin. Well, they had a bad experience with the NOPD and some drugs. So they had never come back in 10 years, and so it was a big deal. So the guy that was a promotion director worked, uh, worked for, well, sorry, of the promotion director of the station was in the Grateful Deadish fraternity called Phi Kappa Sig, I think it was called. So he got incredible pressure for tickets, and he made the cardinal sin, which I will always advise you against, he ended up selling promotional tickets. He got promotional tickets from the station, from the promoter to give away on the air to promote the show and he sold them to his boys. And he got fired by the uh, GM, who um, at the time was, you know, I had been doing this, I had been like calling in guest lists to Tipitina's for like two weeks. And I said, uh, well, you know, I should be the promotion director. She's like, well, you don't have any experience. I said, well, give me a chance. So it was like that one moment where I stepped up and I was actually given the chance to be the promotion director. And I actually did, did the job and I kept the job for two years. And I was trying to figure out how to make a, you know, how do you make that jump now that you've done good things in the city and you got to know all the promoters and Tipitinas and all these different people. And I, I but nobody, you know, would give me a job in the business. So I, I went up to the CMJ convention where I'd gone uh, the year before to represent TUL. And that, the guy who had gotten me into TUL was now working at CMJ. So he snuck me in. And while I was there, I got a job, I got an internship working for a company called the BBC, which does, had great radio programs based in England, and they had an office in, in Westchester. So when I got out of school, I went to CMJ, and I got a job as a doorman on Park Avenue because nobody would give me a job in the business. So I needed to save up money. Even though I'm a college-educated guy with a you know, history and political science degree and great TUL experience, nobody's given me a job. So I got an internship working for this company, and I commuted two hours each way every day to go to this place, which I lived in Staten Island, which is the southernmost part of New York, to Bronxville, which is up in Westchester. And so for two hours each way every day for free, 
I commuted to this job and I, I learned what was called radio syndication, which is the long form, uh, hour long radio programs, whether at concert or I ended up later doing uh, Rick D's Top 40 show and Howard Stern's show, um, King Biscuit Flower Hour, uh, and a show called Rock Over London. So I ended up working on these shows and I finally, after three months of working for free, they gave me a job starting at 10 grand a year. And I was thrilled because I was in the music business. So this is before you're all born, probably in uh, January 1984 or something like that. Yeah. So anyway, so then I did radio syndication and that I thought I was going to get in the record business. But as a fluke, I went to the New York Giants made the Super Bowl in 87 and I went to L.A. And while I was there as a fluke, I got a job working in the film business for a producer named Dino De Laurentiis, who Academy Award winning producer. Um, and just randomly I got this job and I ended up moving to LA and started doing film promotion. So next thing I'm in the film business. And I t tell you all this stuff because the point is like doors open. Like you may think you want to do something and, and then all of a sudden another door opens. You're like, well, no, but I want to do this. But I'm telling you that sometimes those doors can lead you in a circuitous route back to where you want to go or you may get to a different place and go, wow, I actually like doing this. So. Anyway, so I'm in the film business. I'm thinking, I'm going to stay in the film business. This is fantastic. But while I was there, I saw a hateful side of the film business because the guy never listened to his people and made nothing but bad movies. I mean, I went to work there because he was working with a filmmaker named David Lynch who had done Dune and did Twin Peaks. He was a cool, cool as hell filmmaker. And I thought, well, this would be great. I'll work. Well, he never made a David Lynch movie while I was there. But anyway, so he went bankrupt. So then I'm jobless, and all of a sudden, I get a call to, about the idea of going to, back to New York to work for A&M Records. And A&M Records at the time, John had been at A&M Records probably 10, 10 years before me, eight years before that, and we didn't know each other. But um, I went back to New York and I did what's called local pro radio promotion. And that's the art of, you know, you have artists come in town, you take them to radio, you promote their shows, you get, you know, you get them on the radio stations. And that was a great experience. I got to work with a lot of great acts. Um, and I was, once again, I was back to that place where I was at TUL, where I was kind of the king of the city. I had tickets to all the shows, I had an expense account, you know, life was good. And uh, so I did that for three years and then I got a job offer to move back to LA to work for Electra Records. And they had acts like the Sugar Cubes and the Metallica um, and just uh, tons of great acts. So I was blessed by the first two record labels I worked for were kind of the cool boutique record labels. So I did that for three years and did national promotion. I got really sick of radio promotion. It's a, uh, it's a slightly uncreative, very sales-oriented job, but what it teaches you is it teaches you follow-through, and it teaches you resourcefulness, uh, and it teaches you teamwork to work with all the different, there are local, or used to be local people at all the different record companies. I don't know how much you've covered as far as record promotion goes, but it still to this day, to me, is the lifeblood of the business. There, everybody talks about the internet and obviously how important it is, but if you want hit songs, they need to be put on the radio stations, whether it's satellite or tr terrestrial radio, um, and, and they need to be hammered. And those impressions that get created by radio and all that leads up to them creates hit artists and hit songs. So to me, there's nothing more important than it still to this day if you want that, um, because they put, you know, the the good labels can put the thing in a cannon and blow it out. And, but I was, I was always looking for more. And, and it's funny, when I, back in track, when I was at the film company, there was a woman there that did music for the film company. I ended up hanging out with her most of the time because she was cool. And everybody else was kind of, I don't know, film business-ish, which is you know, not as cool. And the music business has, definitely has a larger cool factor than the film business. The film business to me is much more soulless and um, because the stakes are higher, and the money's higher, it takes more, obviously a ton more money to make a film or a TV show than it does to make music. And there's just much less soul in that side of the business. But in my head, I said, you know, someday I'm going to get myself a job as a, as a person that does music at the studio. I just like backed it in my, my head. So then I did the film promotion uh, for, I'm sorry, I did the record promotion for Electra. And then while I was there, um, the A&M came back to me and said, we want you to come back and we want you to do, create kind of a soundtrack division for us uh, and do consumer marketing, do those two things. So I went back to A&M and we had a great run. We had Blues Traveler, we had Gin Blossoms, we had Sheryl Crow, 
and I was able, the first two soundtracks I did, both got nominated for Grammys, one with a Sheryl Crow song that I asked her to do, actually I asked her to do a Fats Domino song called I'm Gonna Be a Wheel Someday for a Robert Rodriguez um, movie he did. So, so I'm back, I'm in this soundtrack position now at a and I'm learning from the master, there's a guy named David Anderley, who John I'm sure knows, and he had done everything from Good Morning Vietnam to the, to the John Hughes Pretty in Pink films, uh, and he was kind of a master of his game, but he was a salty guy and didn't, hated the business because he had to deal with all these film people and soulless film people. And he was a real vibe record guy, classic guy, he worked with Brian Wilson, you know, the Beach Boys back in the day. So, but all of a sudden now, now I'm dealing with all these film business people. And I'm back in that position I had thought about, but on the other side, and we do soundtracks, uh, you know, we did, a, again, our first two got nominated for Grammys. I did a soundtrack called um, Truth About Cats and Dogs with Uma Thurman, the Suzanne Vegas single that did very well. And then I did a movie called Empire Records. And Empire Records, anybody heard of that movie? So it's a, it's a fascinating story because I thought I was set. Like I had points on this record, and this movie was, it was Liv Tyler's first movie and Renee Zellweger's first movie. <coughs> directed by the guy that did Pump Up the Volume, and you know, the movie looked great. It was like a musical. It was so musical, and we did a great soundtrack with it. all the bands at the time, you know, Gin Blossom Single, Edwin Collins, Cracker, Cranberries, Toad the Wet Sprocket. And so I, I'm set. My record company's pushing it, which is very hard to get a record company at the time to push a soundtrack because they always want to focus on the artists. And soundtracks were viewed as one-off compilations with not enough intrinsic value to the record label. So I walk into a, a, a meeting at Warner Brothers Films that had spent $11 million to make this film. And the head of the marketing who now runs the company that just did the Twilight movie and is basking in the glory of having that franchise um, says, you know what, we decided we're not going to release the movie. And I was like, well, that's impossible because I got you know, a hit soundtrack, so I'm going to propel your movie which is rare that you actually get out in front of the movie. You have two videos on the, on the air and two songs on the radio. Doesn't really happen. It's like textbook marketing that you dream about. And he's like, yeah, you know, we're just not sure about the movie. You know, we don't want to spend another eight to $10 million to market it. And so I have, I have to make this decision. Like if I go back to the record company and tell them that they're going to not release this movie, they will bail on the soundtrack, even though they got hits on there. So I, f I go into the marketing media at the record company, and they say, all right, so what's the plan for the, uh, the movie? And I say, well, is, they go, it's, it's still, uh, I think at the time, like 2,000 screen was the max you can go, and a 1,000 screen release was good. Now it's a 4,000 screen release is the most you can go for the blockbusters, and a 2,000 screen release is good. So is it still on 1,000 screens? I go, ah, you know, it's probably going to be like 500. And they go, all right, well, that's still okay. You know, that'll be good. We got the hit singles. We're good to go. You know, keep us posted. Next marketing meeting. How are we looking? How's it look? Well, it's probably, yeah, it's looking a little smaller. They're going to go more of a boutique release and try to catch it on. More like 250. And they're like, oh, man, that's not, so, <laughs> that's not looking so good. But you know what? We got two hit songs, so we're good. So then a couple weeks later, you know, that we put together, uh, they asked for a marketing meeting with the film company. So in the pre-marketing meeting, I go, listen, I just got the word. They're probably just going to go on like a couple theaters, and they're going to see how it works out. If it, if it goes to the next level, they'll take it farther. And they're like, what are you kidding me? I'm like, how could this happen? How'd you let this happen? I said, well, look, this is Warner Brothers Pictures. You know, I had nothing to do with it. Um, anyway, the bottom line, it was released in one theater in Westwood to qualify for their home video division to, you know, the, the rules that they had to do. So I'm devastated. And my company's livid with me. And I said, look, this is a great compilation. You got two hit songs. It's always the thought about the movie coming out. If the movie comes out in stiffs, then your record goes down a cliff. But if the movie d never comes out, or then it has the same principle. It'll go off the cliff, but it's not a stiff, so it has no negative stigma, which is interesting. So I go to the head of the president of the company and the head of sales, and I say, listen, this record is really good. And if you do what you normally do with the record, it'll just get returned in droves, because we'd already shipped. I don't know, 50, 100,000 copies. I don't remember what the numbers were. So I said, I'm asking you to do something you've never done before, and that's basically midline a record right away. And the concept of midline, I don't know if you've gone through this or not, but wholesale, I mean, I'm retailing a record was at the time, I don't know, 14.99 or whatever it was. Midline is basically you cut it in half, and you make the retail price about 7.99. So that they wholesale it, you know, that they basically, the retailers have 
a vested interest in keeping the record because they can, they're still getting it for less and selling it, but they're moving it, and they can move it, and they can put it right up front. And so there was a lot less money to the company, but they realized that to have the thing come back in, in droves made no sense because once it hit HBO and once it hit video, it would have a life. And so they agreed to do it for the first time ever. And the thing, you know, I remember going to Tower Records when there was a Tower Records and seeing it right up front for $7.99. You know, there was no release of the movie yet, but um, then all of a sudden it hit HBO and the thing exploded and it started selling and then it hit video and it, and it just created this amazing life and it, and it went on to sell almost two million records. So it was an interesting lesson because you realize when you think you have everything lined up, it can still fall to shit basically, sorry, sorry for that. But, um, so, but, but you can make steps to help things along the way and you know, you can MacGyver things and do angles to figure out things to do it. So I learned a lesson there. Anyway, so then I did a soundtrack with New Line Cinema for a movie called Don Juan DeMarco with Johnny Depp and Marlon Brando. And the guy who ran New Line Cinema had an interesting situation. He now runs the company. Had an interesting situation where he was the head of music, but he had written a script. And this is talking about being able to change your life with one simple moves. So he told me about the script, and it was a great idea, uh, and we were friends. And he said, why don't you come to work for me while I have this situation where I'm going to be able to write and try to produce this movie while running the music department at New Line Cinema. And I love the aesthetic of New Line. They made great movies. Um, and they had a guy named Mike DeLuca that was the head of production who was a fantastic producer. Um, so I went there and I did soundtrack, produced soundtracks like Boogie Nights, Rush Hours, Austin Powers, Wedding Singer, um, Rush Hour, Money Talks, Wag the Dog, just some of the really cool Boogie Nights, great, great stuff. And so, so I was this, I got back to the place that we had talked about earlier where I envisioned in 1987 that I wanted to be the guy at a studio. So 10 years later or whatever it was, if it was that far, I don't remember. Uh, yeah, about eight, ten years later, I got to that place. Then when I saw what this guy was doing, that he was producing a movie coming from music, I was like, you know what, that's what I want to do. I want to be like that guy. So i got to figure out that path, how I get there. What do I do for myself? So, at, uh, you know, about three years into the job, I have a lot of success, and Jive Records calls me up, and the guy who's now the CEO of BMG, his name is Barry Weiss, one of the best record guys in the business, and the, the West Coast G, GM at the time was a guy named Neil Portnow, who is now the president and CEO of the Grammys. So they came after me and said, look, we want you to do soundtracks for Jive. And I'm, I'm saying, you know, thanks, guys. But and Jive at the time was a small label, boutique label, that, had very, that was incredibly commercial. And they had the Backstreet Boys. They had R. Kelly. They had done Tribe Called Quest and, and Houdini and really some great hip-hop and some great rock like uh, Stone Roses and kind of cool stuff from England. But they also had very pop commercial sensibility, but I said, no, thanks anyway. Uh, I'm at a film company. I'm going to stay there. And they said, well, no, come on. We really want you. And of course, sometimes you say no to people. If you're in a power position, it can really help. So at this point, they kind of kept coming and kept coming. I said, look, I said, the only reason I would go there is if you guys, and I'm just throwing this out, if you guys would want to invest in your artists to make some movies with them. And they were like, wow, really? I said, yeah. I mean, you know, you're Justin Timberlake, Britney Spears, R. Kelly, you've got these interesting artists that have a unique perspective that, you know, if you put two, three million dollars behind and make a movie, their fans will come if done the right way. So they said, that's really interesting. So they fly me to New York, to New York to meet with this guy named Clive Calder, who you guys should really research this guy. Clive Calder, you should write his name down. And when, when you research him, you may not find much information about him because he is one of the, have anybody heard of Clive Davis here? No. Clive Calder is the anti-Clive. Clive Davis is out there. Everybody knows him. He's you know, a tremendous record guy, signed these big guys, and loves being in the media. Clive Calder is the other guy that you never hear about. You probably never see his picture online. You could probably find him by now. But at the time, he had never done an interview. He was the wizard behind the curtain behind this company called Zamba, which had a publishing division called Zamba, had a record company called Jive Records, had a composer division, had a, film, a record studio, had a a cartage for equipment, for music. He created this whole vertically integrated business where he basically didn't need anybody else. He had his own songwriters, own producers, everything. It was his own kind of island, and he never gave his A&R people credit because he was worried about people stealing them and their ego getting bigger. 
He never gave him points. He said, if you want to work here, this is what it is. So he, uh, so I went and sat down with this guy and I pitched him my idea. And he said, you know, I had an artist years ago named uh, Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince. And there was a star named Will Smith. Um, and I'll tell you a quick side story about how those guys got signed. They were, they were this rap group in Philadelphia and they were, they were, they were managed by some mafia type guy. And they, you know, Barry uh, had always done research from radio and figured out what's playing in the local markets. And that's how he found Mystical, for example, who's a New Orleans rapper. And he saw this guy, Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince, were getting played in Philadelphia. So they reached out to find the guy and, and they said, yeah, well, he signed to this little label. Little guy self self managed or self label, and they contacted him. and They said, "Well, we're interested in you know buying your artist out or making a deal." And the guy said, "Well, yeah, if you got X amount of dollars, I'll do it." So, because he was dead, no, he said, "No, no, no." Then he finally called the guy. He says, "Yeah, I need money. If you can come up with this kind of money, if you can bring cash to Philadelphia, I will sign a contract and you can take the act." So, Barry Weiss got on a train and went to Philadelphia with a with a you know suitcase of money. And basically said, you know, here's the money. And the guy opens it up. And in fact, first of all, puts, puts a weapon on the table and says, all right, so what do you got? Opens the briefcase. He goes, not enough. He says, what do you mean it's not enough? We got a deal. And he says, yeah, but I, you know. I... And so Barry happened to have expensive watch. And he said, well, what else you got? And he said, what do you mean? I got, you know, I got a $200 on me. He goes, all right, I'll take that and your watch. And I'll sign the paper. And so this is kind of, I just say this because the mentality of people that you sometimes encounter in the music business who, for some reason, have got into a situation of power. And you have to figure out the angles of how to get what you want with them. So anyway, my point being that Clive had the opportunity early on to invest in the TV show Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, which launched Will Smith to just massive proportions and never did it because he was very frugal and very smart, frugal, more frugal than anybody. But, and he always regretted that. So, um, so I pitched him this idea, and he said, fine. He, so he gave me a development fund to work on. He let me go to screenwriting courses. He let me go to producer's courses. And then the woman who I used to work for came in with a, a woman, pitched the Britney Spears idea for a movie. The woman who was the writer went on to create a little show called Grey's Anatomy. And so before, but before she was Grey's Anatomy, she was, you know, wrote this movie. So we made this movie called Crossroads, and that was my first experience to be able to bring back a film to the state of Louisiana, to shoot in Louisiana, and to be able to use, I think I used uh, New Birth Brass Band in the movie, um, and to be able to get New Orleans music into a film and to have a, a band perform. So, so anyway, so that was kind of a, a really great crossover for me, because as a Tulane guy and a fan of Louisiana, I always viewed my mission to be able to get music into film, uh, to get, you know, New Orleans music and expose it as much as possible because it's, you know, I don't know if you guys understand it yet, but it is one of the greatest American resources, the New Orleans culture and its music, and you guys are blessed to be able to go to school here and be part of it. And I really make, you know, I just implore you to go out and see local music and, and learn and meet other musicians and, and, and figure out how you can work with them to help promote them because they are also some of the best and they are also some of the most dysfunctional. So they need what, what I think they need, what are called connectors. And connectors, if you ever read the Malcolm Gladwell book, Tipping Point, you should read it, because there's a whole chapter on what I call connectors. And it's what I've been called and what I view myself as. These are people that can help other people do things. Or they can, you can make things happen for other people and put deals together, which is how I've been making a living for the last couple of years. And, and that's what producing is. You take pieces of something, a script, uh, a star, money, and you put them all together and you connect them. And that is basically what producing is. And obviously when you're talking about record producing, it's more the technical aspect. But if you look at a producer like Rick Rubin, who's one of the greatest rock producers of all time, and this year was voted the Grammy producer of the year. Rick's not a technical guy, but Rick is a vibe guy. And Rick has ideas and he has great ideas. So it's you know just another aspect jumping off of um, what it is. So back to Clive Calder. Clive Calder, I went to work there and I started producing and, we, and I co-produced this movie Crossroads and we tried to do a couple other movies but it didn't work. And then he engineered one of the greatest train robberies in the history of the music business. He had made a put deal with his parent company BMG. And by the way, this is also the guy that stole the group in sync away from the parent company. 
and, and got away with it. And also having the Backstreet Boys basically sign their rival. The Backstreet Boys at the time were one of the biggest bands going. He signs their rival from the parent company. I mean, total balls, this guy. Anyway, he lined up this put deal with BMG, and he sold the company for $2.7 billion. Now, he was also 98% stockholder in the company. The only other guy that had money was Barry, who had 2% based on uh, his the deal that he was going to leave, and he got 2% out of him to stay. And he was also a Cayman Island resident, which means that you are not American taxpayer. Okay? So that, to me, is the greatest train robbery of all time in the history of the music business. Um, so he's, a, he's an interesting guy just to watch. And I don't think you could do what he did now. I, I don't think you can. But he did it in the 90s, and he hit it out of the park like Grand Slam time. So he's, he's a mentor in that sense that, you know, you know, and he was a South African bass player who just, you know, created this thing. But anyway, so after that, uh, I worked for eight years there, and I produced soundtracks for them. And I acted as their in-house uh, film and TV representation and also their in-house agent. I would try to get our acts, you know, the first thing we did about Britney Spears, can she act? Well, let's put her on this fluff show called Sabrina. She walks in, boom, nails it, everybody loves her great. Then let's put her on a real test, put her on Saturday Night Live. And that's, you know, live TV, you've got to be on, boom, everybody loves her. So we, we decide that we're going to spend $11 million and we're going to make this movie. <laughs> And we make this movie, and we shoot in New Orleans, and it's a great experience. And I like, I'm in love with the film business again, because we have a great director and great producer. And we have great stars. We have Dan Aykroyd and Kim Cattrall from Sex and the City, and this girl, um, Taryn Manning, who was in Eminem's 8 Mile. And anyway, so it turns out to be a great experience. And I said, that's what I want to do. I want to just keep producing film-based movies. Um, but, but because the company gets sold, we don't make any more movies. So I decide that I'm going to go on my own. And at, the, at the time, actually, while I'm, decide, I'm thinking, I go, I can't really leave because the business is too good. You have a great expense account. You, have, you never see a cell phone bill. You don't pay health insurance. And at the same time, the soundtrack business, because the internet starts to kick in hard, starts to fall off. And I realize my time is limited. Without him there to make movies, and with the soundtrack business plummeting, I know my time is limited. So I have to figure out my, what you call your aftermarket strategy. And the strategy is that, you know, I'm going to try to produce movies, but how am I going to do that? So I get this idea to make a hip-hop horror movie, and none of the artists on the label makes sense for it. So the iconic guy that would makes the most sense, who'd already done a horror movie, is Snoop. So I wrote this movie with another guy called Snoop Dogg's Hood of Horror. Very campy, out there, and I find another crazy story about how, you know, I have another saying that half, it's not my saying, but it, half of life is just showing up. And this is a great example of that. I go to anybody watch, everybody watches ESPY's TV show? ESPN has an award show, and this is the first year they have it. So I go to this thing with a friend, and I'm standing there waiting for the elevator. This big, six foot eight, light skinned African American guy, and he's got this little camera, and it's like barely, you know, the guy's hands are this big, right? It's like barely in his hand. I go, So where'd you get that camera? He says, China. I said, What are you doing in China? He says, well, I was playing basketball. I go, he goes, why well, I was on, I use, he says, long story short, he's a Stanford All-American. He's now, the, at the time, he's the uh, running uh, tight end for the Raiders. And he, his roommate at Stanford was Yao Ming. No, I'm sorry, he was on a travel team with Yao Ming. And so he went to visit Yao Ming. And so because this guy's his camera, we have a conversation. We end up striking up a friendship. He's got these bands he wants me to listen to. Come in my office. He says, you should meet this guy, a guy I know from the Bay Area, you know, wealthy guy, he wants to do some sort of publishing company. I said, great, bring him in. Guy comes in my office, we talk publishing. He sees the script on my desk, Snoop Dogg's Hood of, Store, Hood of Horror. He says, what is this? I said, oh, it's a movie I'm trying to make you know, for Snoop. He says, well, Snoop into it? I said, yeah, you know, he's, he's read it. His people have read it. He never read it. Um, and uh, if I find the money, I can make the movie. So he didn't say a word. He says, can I read it? Sure. Calls me back. He says, really like that script. You know, can we make that movie? And I was like, what do you mean can we make it? He goes, well, how much does it cost? I said, well, it's budget of two and a half million dollars. He says, that's cool. I go, what do you mean that's cool? He says, well, I'll write the check for it. I go, what? He says, yeah. I, you know, I, so I go up to his house, and I understand. He's a multimillionaire real estate guy. And he wants to get in the game. So we end up making this movie, and it, I do it around my schedule, and Snoop's schedule, because Snoop's also coaching his kid's football team at the time, and his, his schedule's really, really conflicted. But anyway, we decided to shoot so I could work every day. 
We shoot Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. So I would go to work, go to the set, go home, catch a couple hours of sleep, go back to work. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday, Friday, we were off so I could get full days at work, and we'd shoot all day Saturday and Sunday for a month. So we make this movie, and, um, and the experience is, is a tough one because I bring in the director, who's a friend of mine, but the money guy I was telling you about turns out not to be the sweet guy I thought he was, and he's controlling because it's all his money, so it's understood. But he gets into it with the director, and I am smack dab in the middle. So it's a very tough job, and you realize that's why, you know, People make a lot of money doing it when they get to the high level because it is a high stakes game. Um, so I learned that, that the film business is not so sweet, you know, the producing is not so sweet after all. But uh, the movie turns out and then all of a sudden I start getting these other things. I do a TV show with Johnny Rotten for Fuse called Battle of the Bands. I do a um, Billy Ray Cyrus movie which is coming out on Lifetime in April. And then I do a rock opera for Lionsgate, which some of you all show you the trailer for that later on, which just came out on DVD. Um, and then last year I produced a TV show, an environmental TV show on Discovery Channel with Ludacris and Tommy Lee called Battleground Earth, where I sent them around, de devised shit for them to do and, 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 and all about learning about the environment as opposed to the Al Gore model, which is more lecturing. We made it really entertaining and crazy <coughs> so that kids could try to understand it and get into it. Um, so anyway, so I've now created this niche where I'm basically producing these uh, music, <coughs> using music talent to help get films and TV shows made. And the next thing I'm about to do is uh, start working on a TV show for the troops and their families, which is kind of like taking the old Bob Hope USO model, uh, where you basically get a lot of, you know, act, I'm sorry, comedians and, and musicians and put on show for troops and it'll be a network show in the fall. But so anyway, the path is interesting because you see it starts as ripping news off the, off the thing at, at TUL all the way up to producing TV shows and movies and on all the things I've tried to do. I brought Battleground Earth back here. I shot last year with, I brought Ludacris to shoot with The Roots at Jazz Fest just so I couldn't uh, break my streak of 29 years of Jazz Fest in a row. So I had to bring a crew of 80 down here to, uh, to make that happen, but I got it done. Um, and now I'm working on another possible show that uh, MTV's launching a show called Five Dollar Cover, which you'll start to see in May, which is all about the local music scene in Memphis, which I want to try to bring to New Orleans. And, and obviously because there's such great music here. So I'm always looking for ideas and, 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 that to, and that's what a producer has to do. They have to keep churning out ideas and pitch them and most things you get smacked in the head and rejected, but occasionally something will get through or someone will bring you in to uh, produce. So that's kind of my path. And I just wanted to throw that out, even though it's very long, because it shows, I think, the different doors and stuff that open up that you never know why you're going into. But they, for me, it's all, it's all worked. You know, all the different experiences have worked and added up to, to put it together. The other thing I forgot to mention is that I started, while I was at A&M, I started uh, music supervising films. And I don't know if you guys have talked much about that, what that game is, but basically you're the guy with the director of the film, with the producer, and you're bringing them music to help choose what's going to go into the movie. And so that's how I parlayed myself as a music supervisor into a producer on films. Because I said, look, I can come in, help you cast, help you work on the script, but all the while I'll be working on the music. So you don't have to worry about the music, which is, which is a thing that messes people up because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's full of minds to try to get the right music and create the right music for your movie, deal with the composer because a lot of times directors and composers speak totally different languages. You know, a director may be great at a certain craft and, 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 and putting all the pieces together for a film, but music's its own language. And sometimes you're what I call the interpreter between the director and the composer and all the bands that you may want to bring into your movie and figure out. So that path, you know, once the soundtrack thing started going off the cliff, I started music supervising independent movies, and I still do that. I'm doing a Heather Graham movie right now. Um, so kind of a very long-winded path and I just want to take a break and see if anybody has any questions over all that verbose. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, one of the things that you talked about is always being open to doors and whatnot. Could you talk a little bit, could you talk a little bit about how um, like for every door that you saw that was available, how many were you like, no, that's not something I'm thinking about or better yet, how did persistence 
Well, I think that's the reason I told the story about the promotion director at the beginning was I didn't have the experience for that job, and they wanted to give that job to somebody else. And I could have said, you know what, you're right, I don't have the experience, and I could have just said, I'll be this, you know, I'll keep being an assistant for it. But it was really something that sticks in my head is my first empower, business empowerment moment where I said, you know what, I gotta grab this moment right here, I gotta step up, and I gotta be aggressive with this woman, even though I didn't really have a great relationship with her, I didn't know her that well, but I said, you know, look, just give me the shot, and I was aggressive with it. And um, the promotion thing is another one. Like, I knew at a certain point, I didn't want to do this anymore. Like, I knew that the, it was a dinosaur-oriented business, even though, it's, as I said, it's still super important. It had no soul to it for me, and I just didn't want to do it anymore. But it was such a golden handcuff situation that I, I let it play itself out. And as opposed to getting another promotion, and I was lucky, because the guy who, was, who now manages No Doubt and um, Beck and a bunch of different people was the general manager at, at A&M Records at the time, and he and I had played basketball together, and, and the, the guy who was now the president, Al Cafaro, I knew also when I worked as a, lo um, as a local guy. So he, those guys brought me back and said, all right, what do you want to do? And I said, well, anything but promotion. They said, well, how about marketing? And I said, all right. And I said, how about soundtracks? They go, all right, how about soundtrack marketing? And I go, great. But those guys said to me, look, we have a job for you. And it, it, it'll take us a month. We've got to move some people around. They fired somebody, and they moved somebody around to fit me in. But, like, that's another thing, like a moment in time where people actually looked out for you. And they said, yeah, go on vacation. We'll have a job for you in a month. I was like, wow, that's amazing. So, but those doors, that door was helped, right, to get out of promotion. And I could have found another job as a promotion guy. But I was helped that someone opened a door for me to a whole new world. And then, you know, when I mentioned David Anderley, they had told David Anderley, uh, the president of the GM, that I was going to work in soundtracks for this guy. And this guy didn't want to do soundtracks anymore. He didn't want to deal with me. So I walked in there, and this guy's like, w what do you want? I go, well, I'm working for you. He goes, no, you're not. I said, well, yeah, you, you know, the president of the company said I'm working for you. So basically, I was forced down this guy's throat, and he was not happy about it. And he made me aware of that and a lot. And it was very tough. But luckily, his assistant was really cool. She was like, she'd been with him forever. And she was like, well, you know, just, I'll, I'll help you. So in other words, you find people to help you along the way. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so again, it's that whole thing. Like, you don't know what's going to happen. But I kind of mapped in my head this path, and it actually worked. But that doesn't mean it's always going to work that way. I got lucky, and I, but I was, I was aggressive resourceful but again a big part of the game is when to be aggressive and when to back off because if people feel that you're too in their face and you don't represent in their space or you're too aggressive and you're calling people too much or emailing people they don't want to deal with you so it's like a it's like a nuance thing you know the music business is a relationship game but it has a lot of nuance to it and I think that's really important to learn you know and, and then the question is how can you guys being here in New Orleans how can you guys benefit and from just getting a degree. And, and one of the things I said is, you know, because of the visual, visual uh, equipment here that's, that's in Loyola, from what I've been hearing from Kevin, I, I would recommend getting to know that equipment and getting to know bands. And I don't know how it's going to work and if you're going to be able to check out equipment and do stuff, I have no idea. So stop me if I'm, if I'm out of bounds here. But the idea of, you know, going out, find a band that you love and, and, and setting up a shoot and say, hey guys, we can make a video for you or, or we can help you, you know, I can help you connect other people or I can do viral marketing for you. I can spread the word about you, you know, to MySpace or, or Facebook or whatever, that I can be your emissary, your connector. You know, what is it that you guys are going to find in your experience here to get you to the next place where you're valuable to someone. And then also remember that, that thing I talked about that, and I'm actually doing this now, another thing I've got to tell you that I'm now doing, I'm a 47 year old intern, okay? I'm working for a guy who manages the estates of The Doors, Janis Joplin, Peter Tosh, Rick James, and Graham Parsons. And this guy has this incredible interesting business where he basically manages dead people. And they don't call you at 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, as a manager, you know, bail, I gotta bail me out of jail. But they consistently kick off revenue. So it's an interesting business because it's only going to keep growing and growing and growing as these legacy rock acts become, pass away and become heritage classic acts like The Doors. And the Doors are bigger than ever right now catalog-wise because of they've, they've been marketed as a brand 
and they've been able to do a great job doing it. And overseas, they're even bigger than they are here. So I, I mentioned that to say, much like I got out of college, I got a job as a doorman on Park Avenue. Why? Not because I was interested in that as a career, but someone had a hookup to get a job. And I banked that money so that I could get an internship even I was after college. So my point is, David Letterman had this expression, he was like, kids today, they just don't get it. Everybody has a sense of empowerment. They think that they should get everything to them. And it's, a, you know, immediate gen you know, it's the, uh, the immediate gratification generation. So I'm saying to you, look, when I got out of school, I worked and then I got an internship. Because I was down here in New Orleans, I, there was no internships to get. I mean, I did a lot of work with all the local promoters, so I got experience. But my point is that you have to understand that it's not an easy road out there, right? So you've got to be, if you really want it, you've got to say, when I'm going to get out of school, I might have to get an internship. Or every summer, I've got to get an internship. And you need to be lining that stuff up now. You need to be aggressive, you need to be focused, and you need to be pursuing people in the you know, most positive kind of way to find people that can help you and be your mentor and be your connector. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, just quickly. You mentioned uh, when you were working in like radio promotion, taught you a lot about follow through. Can you like kind of elaborate? I think sure. That's something that, like, yeah, no, it's great. And, and and again, I was 26 years old, and I'm the local promotion person in the number one market in New York. And it's you know the biggest radio market there is, and, and they were very nervous about putting me in it. And as a matter of fact. Uh, the interview process was grueling. There was a, it was a legendary promotion guy that John knows named Charlie Miner, who was the most flamboyant, southern gentleman, crazy, you know, alcoholic, just party guy, women. I mean, to give you an example, he got murdered by a stripper in his Hollywood mansion on the beach. It's, it's not funny, but it's, it's sadly ironic. But um, who hid in the closet because sh he had thought, she had thought in her demented mind that he was going to take her out of this world and, and be his woman. And he, and he was such an inclusive guy. My joke is in a town of exclusion, being L.A., it's all very clicky, right? He was an inclusionist. Like if he met the valet, Mexican valet parking guy and had a great rap with him, he'd invite him in for drinks, you know? And it was like, you know, so you go to uh, what you think is a dinner of like three people and there'd be 15 people there from all these different walks of life. The president of Def Jam Records today is a guy named Steve Bartles. Island's FDN Records, one of the biggest jobs in the, in the business. Steve Bartles was a DJ in a Marriott in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And Charlie Miner came in one night drinking, and they, he played some, played some of his records, and they vibed. Next thing you know, all of a sudden, we get a new local promotion guy in Florida, Steve Bartles. That's my point. So, again, follow through, right? Promotion. What is promotion? Well, it's the, it's the science of getting your music played on radio. Well, how are you going to do that, right? You, you know, all records speak for themselves, right? Well, in my, in my um, experience, because of the, um, the TUL experience and knowing that tickets are valuable, I made sure that I knew guys at the Yankees, the Mets, the Knicks, the Rangers, uh, Radio City Music Hall. So whenever I wanted to take a program director out or they needed something, I wanted to be the first call. And there was a couple of guys who had started before me that are already better at it than me. But I needed to be right up there. So then when two equal records would come up, I knew that they would give me a shot because we had that personal relationship. And we were friends, right, and the business, business friends. Um, so, but again, if you tell someone you're going to do something, I'm going to send you this or I'm going to do this, you have to do it. And probably my greatest story, which I told Metallica's manager the other night in Austin, um, because they played at South by Southwest, was we were trying to break a record called Enter Sandman by Metallica, which was their crossover from the straight, hard edge rock into a more mainstream rock world. And AOL Radio had finally embraced the, rock radio had finally embraced the record, and they wanted us to get Top 40 Radio. And I, and I was like, whoa, how is Top 40 Radio going to play Metallica? So there was a guy, and the pressure was on, and I was going into New York to go my, for a, a meeting with my boss, and, and, and everybody said they had projections where they deliver. And there was a station in Rapid City, South Dakota, which didn't seem like much, but the guy who programmed there had a relationship. He was a networker, and he talked to all these different radio stations all the time, and they actually listened to this guy. So I said, Bob, you know, you're in, you know, the home of this biker rally in, you know, the North, <laughs> North Dakota, whatever. I need you to play this record. He's like, oh, we can never play Metallica. And I was like, Bob, never say never, because it's a bad, bad word. But 
finally we beat him down and other stations started adding it and, he, and I said, listen, Bob, I need to get this ad. What is it going to take to get you to play the record? And this is the time that the Harry Met Sally film was out. <coughs> and he and I would always talk movies because he loved music, movies and I love movies. And so he said, I'll play it, just t you know, push it me. He said, I'll play it if you can get me autograph Harry Met Sally script here by Monday. I was like, what? He was like, yeah, I love that movie and you know, I'd love to have an autograph script. Okay, I don't know why I'm going to do that, but, and then I hang up and I realize that Rob Reiner's office is across the hall from mine at Electra. And so I said, all right, let, so I, and, and at the time, we, Electra has this great catalog, everything from the doors to uh, just, you know, huge catalog. And so I walk in there with a box of these great CDs to the receptionist. I said, look, I'm across the hall. I, I need to ask you a favor. And I tell her the story. And she's like, well, you know, Rob's pretty cool. He might go for it. So just wait. He'll be back for lunch and just be sitting here when he walks in. Rob Reiner walks in. She says, this is Jonathan McHugh from Lecture across the hall. He brought these great CDs for us. He has, he has a favor for you. So I go in his office, sit down, and he's like, so to tell him the story. He's like, interesting, huh? Metallica. Yeah, I heard of them. And he says, uh, so did, they say who, did he say who it had to be autographed by? I said, no, he didn't. He goes, great. Pulls out a script. He says, to Bob, thanks for all the love, Rob Reiner. And he gives me the script. So I send the script to this guy. I call him Monday morning, doesn't pick up the phone. Call him all day, doesn't pick up the phone. So Tuesday is when the ads get done for radio, when they add, actually add the record. So finally I call the promotion director and I say, look, you need to do me a favor and walk in and put the phone at this guy's ear, you know, because I had done some favors for him in the past. So he does that. Bob's like, he answers the phone, he goes, how the hell did you do that? And I said, well, that's not the point. Are you going to add the record? And he says, no, I can't add the record. I said, Bob, you promised you'd add the record. And I can't do it. I said, look, I'll tell you what, just put the record on once tonight. All right? Don't add the record, but just put the record on once. So he's like, all right, I'll do that for you. And he puts the record on, phones light up. The next day, he's forced to add the record. So, you know, though the science of follow through is, you know, whatever that means, but that's about resourcefulness. So that answers that question. Jonathan, we got to go. Wow. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>